Well, technology failed miserably. Yeah, I hate technology. Well, if anyone joins in, then great. Um, probably not, so this is going to be me talking to avoid. Um, the camera just decided to shut off and then turn on and then turn off and turn off. So we're going to the webcam, which unfortunately has a way lower resolution. So I'm going to apologize right now for the grainy quality of this video, as it will probably be. Um, uh, anyway, so, um, so we had some good comments in the chat of the last one. That was great. Um, one of the, the comments was that my example at the beginning of part one of this, if you're now watching part two, then, you know, watch part one <laughs> if you haven't seen it already. Um, one of the comments was that my example about cooking in a kitchen from 1406 was all the trappings, was living history, but not immersive. But the immersive part of that would be interacting in a manner in which cooks from 1406 interacted. So that would make it interactive. Thank you. Thank you, Takeda. I'm glad to be back with I'm actually, I'm not certain where the accent is on Takeda. It might be Takeda or Takeda. Mm -hmm. I wish English used accent marks. It would be so helpful. Okay, so um, where to do it we, uh, was where we were leaving off. And um, the, comp the question was actually about how to uh, do accurate, if you want to create an accurate picture, but you can't afford, you know, clothing that was made from heirloom silkworms, hand, hand, hand spun, hand woven, hand dyed, etc., all in 100% authentic reproduction um, techniques. Yeah, well, many of us can't, most of us can't. Um, and so I actually do have three videos, a series called Cheapo Similars, <laughs> the Contessa's Cheap Tricks, that will tell you how to create the look that you need for an immersive experience without breaking the bank, which is very important to me. I believe that living history should be accessible to all and not just to those who happen to have um, a trust fund, right? And I've been doing living history since I was a high school student, um, doing it on a very low budget <laughs> and uh, relying on, you know, outlet fabric shopping, et cetera, et cetera. So then that actually segues nicely into for immersive medievalism, do you have to have a perfect kit? And in my opinion, no. Um, not at all, because the immersive part of the medievalism for me is more about the interactions. It's about how you interact with each other and with your environment than how you are dressed. So how you sit, how you gesticulate, perhaps, how you address one another. And that's more important for immersive medievalism, in my opinion, than having a kit that looks like it stepped out of an illumination or that looks like it was recently excavated from a very well-preserved grave. Um, so what that means though, is that you, you, people think, well, then I have to know every single thing about the period that interests me. You know, I have to know everything they would have known. And that's not true, not with a little bit of creativity. So the more you know, about your period of interest. So my interest for interest, is, for instance, is sort of Florence and Burgundy in the 1470s to 1490s. So I would have hypothetically probably been born in the 1460s, 1450s or 1460s. Um, so those are that's my area, my geography and time period of interest. And so I do know a lot. I've done a lot of primary source reading um, and I've read a lot of letters written by people from that era. So I actually have developed a good idea about the mindset and I know a lot of the tiny little details of life. And that's great. And that's good. That will help. Um, that will enhance an immersive experience. But, but with just a little creativity and a little circumlocution, you can fall into this medieval idyll without needing to know everything. So for instance, if I was at um, at an immersive event. I was recently, it's called the Decameron. It's an event I run every year. Uh, it used to be bi-yearly, but now we've gone to a yearly uh, rhythm now that the world has kind of picked up pace again. And um, at this event, we, we have friends. There's very close friends that I only really get to see once a year because we all live very far apart. And I in particular live the farthest from almost anyone in my friend circle um, and generally. And so when we see each other and you know, when we're actually fully into the event and we're discussing real things in our real lives. So let's talk about employment. Well, employment is not a new concept. And even the nobility of the Middle Ages and Renaissance were generally in the employ of someone else. There are very few, <laughs> very few of the aristocracy who weren't in the employ of some greater higher ranking noble, unless you were at the top top 
And even then, amongst kings, there were kings who might sometimes have served emperors or the pope, right? So to say that you have, you know, to discuss your employment, you can do so in this general fashion, right? So, for instance, um, at, at sometimes I have been a professional translator, although that career is much now. Um, <clears throat> so um, the way that you can get around that is, you know, you talk about your employer. That's a perfectly medieval concept. Getting paid is a very medieval concept. There's this weird idea that every, that there were serfs and no one got paid. There were no employees in the Middle Ages. And that is the furthest thing from the truth. Medieval people perfected accounting <laughs> um, <laughs> because of all of the payments and receipts that were coming and going. So, you know, I could say, um, you know, my, 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 the, the form of gameful employment that I used to maintain my Contessa lifestyle has basically vanished. Now I'm having to find other forms of income or other sources of income or other sources of gameful employment. And that's all without me saying, using modern terms like AI has made my career redundant, which it has. Um, and, you know, companies are no longer paying people as much as they were before, which is true. But I could say, for instance, that employers, because the word company is in a medieval concept has a completely different meaning. I could say maybe enterprises aren't paying people what they used to, or employers aren't paying people what they used to, right? And these are all the, the, the idea, you know, the discussions of wages and deflation and inflation, these are not new concepts. It was a, literally led to a peasant's rebellion in the 15th century, several of them <laughs> in different parts of Europe. So to immerse yourself without having to know everything and without even having to say goodbye to the modern world or your real life, the important things that matter to you, it just takes a little creativity to circumlocute or, which means to talk around, sorry, it's a translation language term, to talk around something, to literally use other words to describe it if the word in question is possibly a more modern introduction. Um, and that goes for, you know, if you want to talk about politics at immersive events, modern politics at immersive events, well, politics, yeah, they are as old as civilization. So it is very easy to talk about leaders and, um, you know, political leaders without, you know, using particularly modern terms. Yeah, so for instance, um, you know, even local people didn't, so that's, that's a good point. I'm sorry, the quest point just came up that you don't necessarily, even people now don't know everything about their current events, their current culture, their current history. You know, your, your average Joe Blow off of the street isn't necessarily the best informed. This is true throughout all eras. So if people are talking about something and uh, let's say you're doing an event that's set in 1460, random date, um, and your fellows are talking about something that may have happened in 1460 and you've never heard of it or don't know about it, well, there's a likelihood that you in 1460 wouldn't know about it or wouldn't have heard about it. So you ask them to explain, but you don't ask them to explain as though it's history. You ask them to explain as though it's current events. Right. So that's the other thing about immersive medievalism is that you have to pull yourself out of the idea of about talking about history like it's history and talking about the history of your time period like it's current events or recent history or recent news. So that's another that's another difference. So, for instance, a lot of people, um, they a lot of history geeks, when we get together, we like to we like to geek out about history. And so then we fall into this. Well, you know, in 1432, blah, blah, blah happened. Yeah probably many, well, even like modern people, most modern people don't have an idea of exact dates. In fact, if you want to have an embarrassing conversation with my children, ask them when the American Civil War happened. By the way, they're American, so they should know. And they're in high school. Um, and they don't. <laughs> they have no idea when the American Civil War happened. They didn't even know the century. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> the point is that, um, you know, Medieval people also probably didn't have the best grasp of hard dates. And so they refer to things, history, 
their own history in a more general fashion and even their own current events in a more general fashion. You know, well, some, some time ago, such and such a thing happened or recently this thing happened. Right. Um, so <clears throat> there are, I guess the point is that to do immersive medievalism, you do not have to know everything about your time. And you wouldn't know everything about your time, probably, because I don't know everything about my time now. And I certainly don't know everything about all places. Now, when you're in an immersive medieval experience and you have different eras all kind of coming together. So at my immersive event, the Decameron, for instance, we have people attending who do 14th century. We have people attending who do 15th century. Well, from my 15th century lens, uh, all of my fellow courtiers, all of my courtiers, all of my retainers who are dressed in their Edward III area, you know, um, Black Prince era clothing, I look at them and I just think they're dressed in an old fashioned way, right? Literally, I look at them and I say, well, I think my great grandmother had clothes like that. <laughs> I think I still have some in the chest in, my, in the attics of my palazzo, right? Um, instead of looking at that and saying, oh, wow, that's, that's before my period, right? That's not how a medieval person would view someone dressed in clothing that looks antique, <laughs> that looks old fashioned. They would look at them and say, wow, either that's old fashioned or that's exotic, it's different, but they wouldn't say, oh, that's 12th century, oh, that's 11th century. Medieval people definitely did not have an idea at all about historical fashion unless they had seen it, unless they had portraits of their and their their recent ancestors in it. They, they didn't know. <laughs> and you can tell that because when they depict historic events relative to them. So when a 15th century illuminator depicts 12th century events, the 12th century people are dressed in mostly 15th century clothing. <laughs> right. so, so you have to discard, when you're doing immersive medievalism, you kind of have to discard the idea of being a historian and of being this historical person. And, and for that, I guess you do have to understand how people viewed things and that it helps Immersive medievalism is definitely assisted if you read more chronicles from the era, more firsthand accounts, whether it's letters, whether it's um, law cases, whether it's stories from the era, not, not particular translated to be very close to how they were written, right? That will definitely help with the immersive medievalism and help you understand how medieval people viewed the world. But in general, I've, I've read a lot of accounts and studied a lot of cultural history across most of the Middle Ages. And in general, you know, they their view of the world was that if something was different from them, it was exotic and foreign, not that it was from a different period. So if I see someone at an event and they're wearing 9th century Norse clothing, I just say, huh, that's interesting and different. It's not really my taste, but it's interesting, right? They must be from someplace else. And so then if you're at a multi-time period event um, and you're trying to do this immersive thing, and let's say there's someone who's also from Florence, the way I'm from Florence, right? And But they're from an earlier period of Florence and they're dressed in a way I would not dress because they predate me by a hundred years. Well, the way I get around that from my, my 15th century, my 1480s perspective is I look at them and I say, yeah, I think my grandmother or my great grandmother dressed that way. But... But, you know, if you're dressing that way, then maybe there's a part of the city where people are still attiring themselves in that manner. Or maybe they're from a different part of the sort of Republic of Florence, which didn't just include Florence. It included places like Pistoia and Pisa and um, Siena, uh, much to their chagrin, <laughs> um, much to those other places. Chagrin Florence was happy to control that large area. So, you know, I would just, my rationalization is to just assume they're from someplace I haven't been where people dress that way, right? And that is, that should be your kind of baseline assumption as an immersive medievalist, medievalist is that differences are not out of period. They're just exotic or foreign or old fashioned. Um, and, and that anything that we have in the modern world, there is more or less a medieval analog for right? It might not be exactly the same, but, you know, as I said, with devices, they've had mechan humans have been tinkering with mechanical devices for thousands of years, 
the Middle Ages, the Renna was not this dark time that the Victorians, well, actually that the Renaissance people <laughs> wanted everyone to believe it was, and that the Victorians definitely wanted everyone to believe it was, right? It was, these were very sophisticated, sophisticated, clever people. Cubans have always been sophisticated and clever. It's how we figured out how to cook shit. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, if those watching, if you have any questions, please just pop them in the in the comments. Um, so how to get into it. So the thing about doing immersive medievalism is that you need buy-in from your fellow companions. It is absolutely tricky and difficult and challenging if the people around you don't want to participate. And there is a way to gently bring people in um, and, and you know, rather than just openly saying, okay, we're doing immersive, we're doing immersion now. We are now all officially stepping out. So if I'm at an event that isn't an immersive event, but I want to do immersive things, because frankly, I'm not interested in going to medievalist events unless it's immersive. I'm, you know, I don't go to all the effort. It takes me an hour to get dressed in my, in my 15th century attire. I'm not going to do that to go and sit around and talk about modern things like modern people. No. <laughs> I want the full experience. So that means if I'm going to an event where there isn't necessarily an immersive overarching approach, then I can try to draw people in. So when people start saying things that might sound odd because of the kind of terminology they're using, for example, if we're at an SCA event and people are referring to the SCA, I look at them and I say, the S SCA, that's a very, it's a very strange sounding place. What, what is that? Is that some sort of order? Right. And that might signal to people, oh, OK, we're trying to step back and be immersive about this. And then they might in turn try to play the game. Or if we are already doing immersion and someone starts to slip out, starts to, you know, falls back, which can can often happen. They start to fall back into their modern selves. Then I'll just sort of look at them and smile and say, you say such odd things sometimes. And that's a very gentle, friendly way to, you know, sort of chide them but encourage them, you know, make it funny, make it, make it fun and encourage them to come with you, to come back with you, to come back to you basically in the place where you are. Um, so um, let me see how to get into it. So that's how to get into it. Um, also, if you're actually doing an immersive event or maybe a session, a particular session at an immersive event, if you are the organizer of that, then I always start off, for example, at, at our Decameron. Um, we have a morning reading every morning from the Decameron, from your Decamarone, Boccaccio. And um, if we have new people in the circle, people who've just arrived at the event, I will just sort of gently say before we start reading, I will say, and everyone now let us step out of the tribulations of our outside lives and step into the idyll that we are trying to create here. And that's the signal that we are eschewing the discussion of the modern from a modern lens that we are attempting to now view things as these medieval courtiers in the case of the Decameron, right? So that's how you can get into it. And that's also how you can kind of try to keep people on track. Now, the reality is in my experience, if there are people who just don't want to play along because they're uncomfortable and that's fine, that's everyone gets to do their own thing, then, you know, you, 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 you attempt it, and if it doesn't work, and if they don't seem interested in participating, then either have a conversation with them in a modern fashion or, you know, take your leave in a polite fashion and go find other people who are interested in playing the game you are. And to actually do immersive medievalism at an event doesn't require that the whole event be that way. If you want to make this happen, then you could actually volunteer, reach out to the event organizer and in advance and say, I would like to set up an enchanted area, call it an enchanted area, because, you know, there is a sort of level of enchantment to it, really. You, I would like to set up an enchanted area, um, you know, tell them the kind of activities you would like to be able to do in the area and somehow demarcate it and announce it so that people know there's a place where they can go <clears throat> and they can and try to immerse themselves in the culture and know that in this space, this, this sort of behavior is going to be undertaken. And that if they want to talk about cars and computers and all that in as though they're just modern people in medieval clothing, then there are other places at the event that they can do that. Right. So that's that's an approach to sort of gentling, gentling your way into immersive medievalism if it interests you. 
Um, and <clears throat> my experience is that most people actually who are doing medieval living history, who are attending SCA events, for instance, most people actually are interested in this sort of experience. They just don't know how to get into it. And um, as I said, it's awkward if, you know, it's just them doing it. But if you are bold enough to lead the way, then people, most people will follow. <clears throat> um, and, you know, so, so techniques, we, we sort of talked about techniques. Big technique is trying to frame things in a, oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, Tommaso, one of my, my star courtiers, said, uh, we have weekly readings of the Decamerone at Renaissance Island in Second Life. Um, as they are early Tudor, I'm a blast from the past in my late 1400s Italian clothing. Yep, see, exactly. You're just old fashioned. You never updated. And, and the reality is that with fashion, this is a bit of a tangent, but go with me here. The reality is that with fashion, there are always people, there are always people who are wearing last season's fashions. But in, pre, in the pre-modern era, last season's fashions were more like the last 10 years' fashions, right? And in some cases, for older people, especially the last 30 or 40 years' fashions, you can always, you, you can find it in re reported in chronicles, you can see it in the art. Um, <clears throat> so um, back to techniques. Basic technique is to try to frame things, anything you want to discuss, whether it's modern or medieval, from the lens of the person you are trying to be, for which you might have to do a little more reading, but not necessarily. Sometimes it just takes some creativity. Um, and you can talk about modern objects in a medieval fashion. Cars are carts or wagons. And in fact, in German, the word for car is wagon. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> you know, computers are, you know, a full computer, well, they, they, I, they actually had abacuses, right? That's, that is the original computer. It computed <laughs> figures. Um, and, you know, for my phone and, and or tablet, I call it my wax tablet. And when I uh, need, when I'm at events and I need to recharge it, I go and have my tablet rewaxed because wax tablets actually need rewaxing. <laughs> the wax wears away, literally. You scratch it away with time. Um, so, you know, there are ways to, to discuss, you know, things mundane, perfectly mundane activities and objects in a way that medieval people would have understood. Um, and that includes everything from, you know, computer games. You don't have to call it a computer game. Just say you play this game, this very social game with friends, and it's, it's done in such a way that you can send messengers or couriers back and forth to communicate about the game. See, no need to talk about using social media or anything like that. Social media, that is, you know, Facebook and whatnot. Well, <clears throat> these are just communication networks, right? So, you know, you can refer to them as a courier network, for instance, or the town square. <laughs> I mean, really, what is Facebook but a giant town square where people just post announcements all over the place, right? So there are ways, if you really want to talk about Modern, modern happenings and phenomena and occurrences of relevance to you while you're at your immersive medieval event because you're interacting with real friends with whom you have real relationships. There are ways to do that and still keep it within this medieval frame. <clears throat> are there any questions about that? Anything specific? So part of immersion for some people is having the perfect kit. And we started talking about this. Um, and I, I mean, obviously, the more authentic your kit, the more immersive the experience is going to be for everyone. <laughs> That's funny. I have courtiers who call my travel tra trailer Aquitaine to tell people where I am when I need to leave their fair site. Nice. That's excellent. That's great. <laughs> See, that's that's clever, too. You know, in um in in a uh, Plymouth Plantation. So I I went to I've I'm I actually have I'm a descendant of Mayflower, uh, Plymouth settlers. And uh, so when I was little, we used to go and visit Plymouth Plantation fairly regularly. And one time, I was looking for a particular person, my relative, in fact, the person who interpreted my ancestor, one of my ancestors, and we found the we found someone and in the from from the colony, and we asked them. And they said, um, they've gone to the fields. And so 
we didn't understand that we've gone to the fields means they're not here today. <laughs> so we actually went to the fields and looked for them working, working amongst the, the harvest. They weren't there, of course, because they've gone to the fields was immersive talk for they're not here. So yeah, exactly. That's exactly the idea, Donna, is that you can, there are ways to indicate um, that people have gone off to do modern things that where you don't have to explicitly state it, you know, vagueness is your friend in the immersive experience. Um, and also, as you say, assigning, assigning modern objects or places, more medieval identifiers, you know, to the fields rather than they're up in Boston, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> they're at a, they're at a, you know, but, but even, even when it comes to sports, all of that, Sports are as ancient as civilization, if not maybe predating civilization in the literal sense of civilization. Um, so, you know, there's not many modern concepts that don't have a medieval analog. That is something to keep in mind. And you just have to figure out how to refer to that activity, that concept, that phenomenon in a way that medieval people would have understood. So you do need to be a little creative. But that doesn't mean that you're going to regress or you're going to lapse into perfect 15th century English a la Thomas Mallory, right? No one is expecting that here. I mean, that's awesome if you've learned early modern English as a foreign language. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that's not, it's not necessary and it's not expected. And frankly, most people aren't going to understand you. <laughs> Right. So, and yeah, there's, there's great, there's great tips there. So Donna just said, we use in sooth for real things and in faith um, for things that is in part of the story that you're telling. So yeah, there's, there's all sorts of neat tips and tricks. That's a good one, Donna. Thank you for sharing. I assumed it was in faith. <laughs> Took me a moment, but I, I figured it out. Uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's certain little words, like if you're using English, if English is your lingua franca at your event, and I'm not assuming that because medievalism is a thing that happens all over the world, but depending, whatever your lingua franca is, at, your lingua franca is at your event, whether it's English, whether it's Swedish, whether it's German, there are probably little words and phrases from your era of interest that you can incorporate into your speech to, to give it a more immersive feel. So, for example, the word um, in, in 15th century English, gramercy is a 15th and 16th century English grammarcy is a very common word for thank you, is the more common word for thank you. Um, in fact, thank you is not, I've not really encountered that so much in the 15th century. I give you my thanks might be a more um, turn of phrase. But there, there are syntaxes that maybe you can pick up by reading texts in the, in the, from the era, primary source text from the era of question. And I do recommend that if you really want to get into this immersion thing. It's not necessary. Like I said, you can create immersion just by eschewing blatantly modern terminology, um, but it, it will help. So read, 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 read. Plus, you know, honestly, a lot of these chronicles are like soap operas, especially the ones from the court of Burgundy. My God, the plotting and poisoning and backstabbing, it's great, <laughs> except no one comes back to life. Once they've been executed, that's it. There are no magical resurrections in the court of Burgundy in the 15th century. <clears throat> um, so kit. kit, no, you don't have to have the perfect kit um, for, a, for an immersive experience. Obviously, the more people who have more thorough kits, the better it is for everyone because honestly, the clothing you're wearing, the way you're dressed, the way you look, you actually kind of become part of the atmosphere. You become part of the furnishings in the literal sense of that word. Um, so it will enhance it, but it's not necessary. But there are a couple of little things, little things that, that you can do to, to help maybe make yourself feel more immersed. Even if you don't have the perfect kit, my fire just went out. Handsome, could you please, beloved, beloved, uh, hold on. Okay. Apparently my fire has a time limit and then it switches on to something annoying and loud. Right, so <clears throat> hats, for instance, head covering, even just a simple coif or a simple turban for men and or women will really sort of enhance your feeling of being a medieval person because the reality is that medieval people nearly always covered their head in some way or another. 
um, whether it was with veils, whether it was with coifs, whether it was full headdresses. So just if you don't have a full headdress, that's fine. Just a simple linen coif will kind of complete the picture and give you that sense of being more of being a medieval person because bare heads were like reserved for things like executions and christenings <laughs> um, and ceremonies like coronations. Um, I have a whole video on that too if you're interested, fun with medieval headwear. Um, but just a simple thing will we'll really take you to that next level. Um, and, you know, what is authentic anyway? So authenticity is a spectrum, but in my opinion, it doesn't have an end point. There is an infinity end to authenticity because you can just like, like you can always get to smaller and smaller particles of matter. <laughs> um, there is no end to how authentic you can be. <laughs> Um, because, you know, you can always take it to the next level. You can always, you know, try to resurrect an heirloom breed of flax that has been extinct for 500 years and then have your flax woven from that. And then you can try to resurrect an heirloom uh, cultivar of wood that's been extinct for 500 years and then have your loom made out of that, right? There's always the next level of authenticity. So I don't believe that you have to be perfectly authentic because there is no such thing as perfect authenticity. There just isn't. There is more and more authentic, and that's it. <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, the headwear, the headwear effect, it's, it's remarkable. So here's my theory on my philosophy on medieval headwear, right? A modern person wearing mo modern clothing, but a medieval hat actually looks like a medieval person wearing a modern costume, but a person wearing medieval clothing, but their head, their hair, everything about their face looks modern is a modern person wearing a medieval costume. It's that's, that's been my, that's kind of always been my feeling is that just that little bit of headwear. Ah, so velvet. Yes. Um, but velvet was made. So velvet was available in the 14th century, but it was only, it was so crazy expensive that only royalty actually had it had access to it in the in the 14th century and of course there were sumptuary laws i mean velvet in the 14th century insanely expensive like ten thousand dollars a meter in modern terms um and it was made of silk <laughs> um by the 15th century uh people of the up and coming middle class the very up and coming middle class were starting to be able to afford velvet as well but it was still a very expensive fabric but yes, vel velvet was available as we know it in the in the 14th century, but maybe not as most people know it, it was made of silk. Um, and the pile was generally a little bit thicker than the pile of the kind of modern silk velvet you can get now. Yes, as a queen, you would definitely have had a sideless surcoat out of velvet. Um, the household accounts of Edward III, his wardrobe accounts, and for his queen, Philippa, yeah, they actually had special Christmas clothes, matching suits, of course, made out of the same length of velvet um, for, I forget which Christmas it was, for some Christmas celebration. She had a sort of sir coat, he had a, a coat hardy. And remember, the coat hardy, that's the overgarment. So 14th century basic layers, I'm just going to recap here. Um, linen undershirt, then a coat, which probably laced up, and then the coat hardy, which is the thing that goes over top of your coat, and that one buttons. And that one probably doesn't have full sleeves. The sleeves probably come down to here in general. But there's some exceptions to all of that. And of course, then you have your pourpoint, which is kind of a padded arming garment. But basic layers should be a linen undergarment, a coat, and then a coat audi, and or possibly for ladies, then a, a sideless surcoat over top of the coat and or over top of the coat audi, depending. More layers is better when it's getting cold, by the way. Um, so another question, wonder if I can use my truncated cone paper candy container as a base for one of those 15? Yes, you can absolutely do that. <laughs> um, so my theory on uh, those shaped hats, a lot of the shaped hats is that they were shaped um, of vellum and that's based on the fact that Bishop's miters were all made of vellum, all of them. Everyone without an exception that has it survived or the pieces that have survived, they're framed on vellum. So I'm pretty certain that a lot of the shaped secular headdresses were also. If you watched my Not a Henin series, you can see uh, some extant examples of bishop's miters, actually. <clears throat> Matching clothes, really. So yes, so not so made from the same cut of fabric. Yeah, 
So basically, the um, so did people wear matching clothes in 14th and 15th century? Yes. A lot of household accounts talk about purchasing the entire bolt of fabric to then have suits of clothing made for the, all the family members. Yeah, so yeah, in Texas, yeah. Well, so here's the thing. Um, I also come from a hot and humid place and used to wear all the layers, but you, you, you have to pick the kind of fabrics correctly. So there are summer weight wools, for example. Um, so summer weight wool breathes better just as good as linen, if not better, and is perfectly cool and comfortable, even in hot and humid heat. Boiled wool, you will die a horrible, horrible death. Um, but if your people aren't, are, if your people find even summer weight wool too hot, then you can still get away with the layers, but I would just make them all out of linen, maybe with the top one out of some really nice fabric, but then line it in linen because linen is a wonder fabric when it comes to heat management. Um, do I have any knowledge of the sort of clothing that would have been worn in Portugal in the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance? Yes, I do. I actually do. I was just in Portugal. I was in Madeira and I was in Lisbon several times in the last um, two months. <laughs> and I got to see some art um, that you otherwise might not get to see. And I actually did a video on the sacred art I found in the Museum of Funchal, which includes a lot of 15th and 16th century Portuguese art. Um, there's a video on that. I think that might be on my travel channel, Travels with the Contessa, I think. It's on one of my two channels. But point is, um, yes, so Portugal, the court of Portugal was heavily influenced by, in the 15th century, close dynastic ties with England and with Burgundy. Really super duper with Burgundy because Isabel, the Duchess, Charles the, Charles the Good's wife, she was from Portugal. She was a Portuguese princess. And so there was a lot of, of um, dynastic ties there and a lot of cross-cultural ties a lot of mercantile ties. And so the clothing of Portugal was heavily influenced by Burgundian fashions. Um, and there is actually a tapestry called, there's a, sorry, an altarpiece. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it's called, Portugal, that actually shows, oh, there it is, that actually shows um, the, the entire royal family. It's an immense altarpiece. Here it is. Um, see if I can oh, I'll send I'll, I'll post this pop this into the chat and you can take a look <clears throat> oh linen no you can get linen for way less than $60 per yard oh my goodness no 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 my dear there are way better sources than $60 a yard oh no <laughs> for linen I mean no <laughs> Or are you talking about for summer weight wool? Even there, there's really good sources. Um, so the, the key to finding cheap fabric um, is to actually look for fabric outlets. And uh, Fabric Guru is my favorite online fabric outlet. Um, let me see if that's the correct link. Fabric Guru is my favorite online fabric outlet for amazing, super high quality fabrics um, from all of the big interior design and fashion houses like it's, it's a true outlet in the original meaning of that term it's the bolt ends it's the leftovers that aren't enough for um yeah so for the um i always i always keep my eye on fabric guru um and for summer weight wool there are online other online fabric outlets where you can get it for twenty dollars a yard ebay <laughs> eBay is also a really good place for bolt ends. So do a search for summer weight wool on eBay and you can probably find some really good deals there. A lot of my fabric has come from eBay. <laughs> and linen you can get at fabrics.com often for six to $8 a yard. Yeah, for really good quality linen in all weights from super thin um, all the way up to, uh, to heavy, heavy duty, heavy weight. And um, so fabrics.com, and it's worth signing up for their, um, their email reminders because they do have regular spe specials and sales, and I take advantage of those frequently to stock up and then just have linen laying around um, when I need it. So yeah, fabrics.com, also a very, very good place. Fabrics.com, I think it's fabrics, might be fabrics store, fabrics.com. 
<clears throat> There's also Fabric Store, both fabrics.com and fabricstore.com. Maybe it's not fabrics.com. Mm. Uh, they both they both offer really good. I have to look it up in my email and <laughs> see what the latest thing I deleted from them was. Because I ended up, I'm one of these people who I do fall prey to sales, <laughs> unfortunately, um, especially really good ones. And I when I know they're good, and then I end up with what I have, which is about a hundred yards of white linen in various ways. Fabricsstore.com is the uh, is the place from which I've been procuring my linen for really, really good prices lately. <clears throat> Fabricsstore.com. Yeah, I'll post that here as well. And no, I am not getting paid by any of these people to hawk their websites. So this is a completely unbiased uh, sharing of resources. Um, okay, so yeah, so for um, Portugal, as you'll see, if you look in the the link I posted with the picture of the altarpiece, uh, you will see that you know there's a lot of there's a lot of connections in terms of styles, but some local variations on the Portuguese version of the clothing. And you'll also see that on the Infanta, she's wearing some really interesting weird things, <laughs> um, which I've been wondering about reconstructing her ensemble for a while. It's so it's so crazy, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, seriously, if only I if only I were being sponsored by anyone. Well, a lot of YouTubers are sponsored, so maybe someday someone will sponsor me. Who knows? Um, okay. Um, so you know, there's there's um there's a lot of ways to procure fabrics where you're not paying <laughs> the crazy prices. Oh, and for those of you who live near anywhere near Oregon, <laughs> the um oh, what is uh, Pendleton, the Pendleton Wool Mill, their true, honest to God, real outlet is in Portland or near Portland. And you can get wool, amazing quality wool for five to six dollars a meter. And so it's almost worth if you can get a cheap flight to Portland. It's almost worth flying there and going to the Pendleton Wool Mill to to procure to procure fabric because they really are, their deals are, they, they're selling bolt ends and whatnot. Because for interior designers and for fashion houses, they really can't do anything with less than like 50 or 60 yards apparently. And so um, much smaller than that and it almost counts as a bolt end in a lot of cases, which is fascinating for those of us who don't need 50 or 60 yards to successfully complete a an ensemble. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so um, as, as I mentioned earlier, I've got the cheapo similar videos out there for those who want to try to create a more medieval looking kit, medieval-esque or medievaloid, as we say, um, on a very short budget. Lots of really good tips there, including, you know, secondhand stores. And I, in the video, I provide images of original medieval items so that you get an idea for the shapes and colors and palettes of original medieval items so that when you go to secondhand stores and go shopping, you have an idea of what sort of the things for which you should be looking. Because yeah, I don't believe that you need to have a reproduction in order to have an immersive medieval experience at all. Um, but the layers, I feel like the, 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 the head, you know, just covering your head will just take it to another level. Um, and, um, you know, if you have, most of the layers, the right layers of clothing, it will definitely take it to another level. Um, you know, there's not much medieval looking about wearing a, a short sleeve tunic and nothing else, unless you're a fool, because actually that's how court fools dressed, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, they often wore nothing but a short sleeve tunic, no undergarments, and I mean no undergarments, <laughs> not an undershirt, not an under tunic with long sleeves, not braids. <laughs> So, you know, there were people in the Middle Ages and Renaissance who dressed that way, but they were they were the court fools and they usually suffered from, yeah, they, they weren't the most respected position in the court, shall we say. <clears throat> okay, um, so let's see. We talked about how to keep the immersive environment on track. We had talked about how, we, how to talk about modern things medievally and um, techniques. So, yeah. Overall, um, my experience of immersive medievalism is that it definitely, it definitely allows me to experience the socio-cultural history in a, in a more in intimate fashion, basically, and to get closer to it. 
but also it's a beautiful form of escapism. And, and I will never claim that that is not a big reason of why I do immersive medievalism. And in fact, any period of history for which I recreate the clothing, if I go to events in that period, I definitely try to, to approach it immersively. So um, are there any other questions? Any, any other things you would like to discuss? Just wait for final questions. I hope you all enjoyed the video that was there for waiting for you, for those who actually joined in part one. <laughs> that's, uh, that's actually one of my ladies in waiting and I dancing, having an immersive moment. We had our, my household minstrel was there and um, I, I ordered him to strike up the dance Amoroso and my lady and I danced in the courtyard of our encampment. And it was a really beautiful, immersive moment. <laughs> um, and actually I will say dance is a really great way it's, it's almost one of the easiest ways to do immersive medievalism because your actions are pre-scripted and you know what you need to do if you know the dance. And you, you, you know how to behave, you know how to act, and it almost forces you into the mindset of a person from that era just because of the nature of the movements, the nature of the interaction between you and your partner or you and the other people in your set. So dance is almost a, a sort of like a gateway into immersive medievalism. So I guess it's not surprising that dance is one of the first, one of the reasons I wanted to, uh, one of the things I really wanted to do at my very first event, but unfortunately there was no one there who knew how to dance. So there was no dancing, but um, yeah, that, that's what led me to actually start teaching myself how to do medieval and Renaissance dance because there was no one within a hundred mile radius 70 mile radius of me who knew anything about medieval or Renaissance dance. So I started teaching myself and that is a great way to sort of ease your way into immersion because it almost puts you in the mindset of, of, you know, gentle folk from the era and, and, you know, with the bowing and the, the natural sort of interactions, just put you where you need to be. And then it's almost easy to just carry that through after you've stopped dancing. Yeah. And the music for certain, especially if you have good live music, that will absolutely help with it. Thank you for bringing that up, Darius. That will absolutely create, that will immerse you. That will put your head, your mind, your soul in the right space for it. So if you have a musician who is decent or even good, and they can just sit there and play just in the background, if you're not dancing, just play, just provide music, that will really help with the immersion. But then if you have live music for dance, ah, it's a whole different, I mean, really elevates the dance experience to a whole other level. Yeah, that's a really good point, Darius. Thank you for bringing that up. <clears throat> and that's why I say this is a chat because I'm not the only one who does this crap. <laughs> there are other people out there with experience as we've found in the chat today. So I appreciate everyone chiming in with their questions, thoughts, and experiences. It's really a great way of doing it. Yeah, right, exactly. So dancing with live music, it's it's a whole different thing than say when you're rehearsing to to canned music, as it were. That's great. And I've gotten so used to working with live musicians at the events where I run dance that I get spoiled. And then when I'm suddenly forced to use canned music, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I forget where it is, where my recordings are. I forget how to play it, how to actually make sound come through. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, exactly. It's magical. When you have live musicians, it's magical. And at my Decameron event, one of the big things about my immersive Decameron event is we have one of one of the world's best um, medieval and Renaissance musicians, um, Master Albrecht Alcoffrin of Istampita. And he's my household musician. And he literally just follows us around playing music. And then we say, we would like to dance play this for us. And he plays that for us. And when we're not dancing, he's just sitting there strumming. I come and have him provide music when I'm getting dressed in the mornings. And I have him provide music when I'm getting undressed in the evenings. Right. So that, that really is, you're right. Live music is almost essential to a properly immersive medieval experience because the medieval world was filled with live music pretty much constantly, especially for ceremonies, but even when it wasn't a ceremony. Yeah, I will say that in the last 25 years, 27 years since I've, there's, there's definitely been a general rising of the level of live music across the all the various medievalist organizations. And that's because it's much easier to access. It's much easier to learn how to play now that it's YouTube videos. So yeah, there's definitely been a, a rising. Yeah, oh yeah, you do the Texas Renaissance Fair. Yeah, that's why we can't do Decameron in October or November because um, he's, 
providing music at the Texas Renaissance Festival. Yeah, you should get to know him. He's amazing. And he can play all of the dance tunes. He's amazing, really. And he can sight read. It's it's remarkable. He can also create a 15th century bossa danza out of his head while just sitting there playing for us. It's kind of remarkable. <clears throat> It's funny. So Darius just commented that before he joined the SCA, it was the sounds of the era that attracted him. I too grew up because my parents listened to that kind of music. I grew up listening to medieval and Renaissance music. So it's also part of my earliest memories, um, whether secular or sacred. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's actually haunting. And actually I thought I hated dance until I joined a medievalist organization because the only exposure to dance I'd had was the electric slide in gym class. And that was, that's a terrible, horrible dance. The music is awful. It's soulless. Um, but then I joined, then I joined a medievalist organization and I saw an experience dancing and I thought, oh my God, I actually like to dance a lot. And then I found out that I love dancing in all eras, apparently, except for the electric slide, which is terrible. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> yeah, Albrecht, I will say Albrecht is, is, um, he, he has exacting standards, kind of like I do when it comes to dance. <laughs> it's funny. My, my standards for dance are much more exacting than my standards for kit. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's, that's, not, that's not the same as doing a show. Because when you're doing a Renaissance fair, you know, that's a show. That's a different. It's not, it's, it doesn't have to be different, but it can be different because, you know, you're trying to please a specific kind of crowd. Whereas the kind of immersive medievalism I'm, I'm, I'm mostly talking about is we're entertaining ourselves. We're not, we're not, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I did mention living history villages, interpretation villages where you go and you watch people. But for me, for mostly, it's about doing things on a private level for ourselves and not being on, on stage as it were. Although I'm happy to get paid to be on stage. I'm, yeah, I'll totally put myself out there that way. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, I do. So for myself, for myself, I feel that way about the clothing. I have very exacting standards for myself and, and my condottiero, my Lord husband, very exacting standards. But I am, I don't like to impose that on other people um, who are exploring living history at their own pace. <clears throat> Oh yeah, no, tell, actually, yeah, it's true. Trying to, to unleashing immersive medievalism on on random bystanders definitely has its perks. I have I have done that at demos. Yeah, it and it can be really enjoyable, maybe to their disadvantage. <laughs> I, actually, I find it almost easier to do it with strangers because there's no emotional. I don't feel the emotional connection to come to their level. <laughs> Yeah, the thing about immersive medievalism with your friends, you know, you, you kind of almost feel badly being a martinet about the immersive aspect, whereas with strangers, mm, I don't feel any onus to come to their level. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, for, for me, when it comes to clothing, for myself, I have extremely exacting standards, and that, but that's me, and I don't... I'm loath to impose that on other people because I do believe that living history should be accessible to everyone, especially for people of lower socioeconomic or of lower income status. You know, they should still be able to join in. <clears throat> you know, they should still be able to join in the fun. And with time, they will too be able to slowly improve themselves and accrue more items that help enhance the whole environment. But I don't expect that from new people. Now, granted, I don't mind attending an event where there are standards that are announced in advance, but I don't want all events to be that way. Then how do we get our new blood? Although I got into a nasty fight with someone on the 15th century group on Facebook, several of us did, where they literally said, if you don't have the money to buy replicas, then you should just take up another hobby like barbecuing in your backyard. Literally, that's a quote. <laughs> I was so offended on behalf of all of the people I know who don't have that kind of income um, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Ouch. That I actually, I went, I got on, did Facebook live and did a whole diatribe about it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, again, when it's, when it's a show, it's a different beast. You know, that's, you, you have specific kinds of standards to maintain and that's, and that may be for the good or not, depending on what those standards are. 
But um, yeah, how horrible, exactly. This, this person, there were several people and they were all horrible people. And one of them literally said, well, you know, I don't know what the problem is. I wouldn't leave the house. I wouldn't go to an event without at least three, three sources of documentation for every single item I'm wearing. And I would be mortified were I to do so. And I'm like, well, good, you go be mortified for yourself, but you don't get to gatekeep for everyone else. <clears throat> They're in the, no, these are, these are United Kingdom people. They were all they were all British reenactors. Yeah, there, there's some there are some real snobs in the British reenactment community that I've personally met. I mean, there's snobs everywhere. It's not just Brits, but these ones were particularly bad. Oh, yeah, they were really fun. And when we tried to tell them that you're never going to get new blood that way, they said they had no problem, you know, supplying people for their seven person group. <laughs> um. Yeah, so that's not my version of immersive medievalism, that, that expecting everyone to have exactly the correct things. Because as I said, what is exactly correct in any case? What, where do you draw the line? What is your person? You know, you can have your personal standard, but for everyone else, I mean, I guess if you're running an event, it is your prerogative, absolutely, to say, these are our standards, you have to pass this bar. That's fine. And I believe in those kinds of events too, as long as it's advertised in advance that this is what is expected. But I don't want all events to be that way. We all need a place to start. I mean, where I started, Jesus, <laughs> I almost wish I still had the first set of garb I made, but I gave it away several years after I made it because I knew it wasn't good enough or medieval in any way, shape or form, right? But but we all have to start somewhere. And, you know, not all of us are lucky enough to grow up in a village that has archives that you can just go and check out whenever you want from the 15th century, like a lot of Brits do. <clears throat> Yeah. And then there's, yeah, then there is, of course, the question of numbers and cost. So yeah, you know, I, I do believe that people should be allowed to be made to make compromises and that if you have enough imagination, someone having not exactly the perfect kit shouldn't be able to ruin your experience. And in fact, and in fact, from my medieval perspective, someone in not a perfect kit is just dressed again in an exotic foreign fashion. And that can almost be fun to play with a little bit. Right. Like I can look at them and say, wow, that fabric, let's say they're wearing day glow. I don't know. Day glow lame, day glow orange lame. And I can, from my perspective, that's kind of a wondrous fabric. Right. Like, wow. This is a really wondrous fabric. Um, did, you know, was this a, was this imported from the east? Was this woven in, you know, in somewhere in Persia, maybe, you know, like you can really have fun with it and you don't have to be snarky about it either. <clears throat> Well, I mean, no, not 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 urine, fermented urine. Get it right. <laughs> it needs to be fermented so that you have enough enough um, enough uh, ammonia content so that it actually does its job. Actually, I do want to play around with that. This is going to sound horrifying, and I'm sorry if this disgusts anyone, but it is on my list of things to do is to actually collect urine, probably from some men folk in the household. <laughs> and let it ferment and then do an experiment with laundering some of my dirty white linens and drying it on the riverbank here. Um, yeah, on the grassy part of the riverbank. I actually do want to play with that. And I have actually done indigo dyeing using urine also. It smelled great <laughs> and it was indoors. It was fun. Um, and I would never do that indoors again, ever, ever, ever. <laughs> yeah, okay, so the, the bikini thing, it is fascinating how all periods of living history, all groups for various periods seem to have the bikini wearing crowd, no matter what, whether it's, you know, medieval chainmail and bunny fur bikinis, or Ren Faire bikinis, or the Wild West buskin, yeah, buckskin bikinis, I don't know. Um, I, Again, I, while it's maybe not my preferred aesthetic, as a medieval person, I would look at someone dressed that way and wonder at the damage the sun must be doing to their skin. <laughs> yeah, the bikini barbarians. Yeah, and you know, I that that I might I might view them actually as some wondrous personage from Marco Polo's Book of Wonders. You know, are they from one of the lands that the great Marco Polo once explored? You know, that's, that's how I would view it. It would, it just, to me, it just adds color to my medieval world because the medieval world was frankly a diverse place. Most of Europe, 
very interconnected merchants from all over, not just Europe, but the Middle East, and in some cases, Asia, depending on where you were, and even some cases, Far East of Asia, depending on where you were. So, you know, medieval people had an idea that there was a world beyond their little village, even if they might not get to that world necessarily. <clears throat> okay. Oh yeah, the so, so the Dyers and the Fullers were nearly always on the edge of town <laughs> and near the rivers because of the stench. Yeah, um, that's that's exactly correct, Anna Lizette. Yep, that is that is very true. Um, yeah, Dyers, the Dyers and the Tanners, they had to be kept outside of the common areas because they smelled horrible. Also, medieval people eventually discovered that you needed to keep the powder house outside of the city walls because powder houses had a tendency to explode inside the city and set the whole thing on fire. But it took them a little while to figure that out, unfortunately. They figured out the urine thing sooner. Well, so Norse people, you mean, because Viking, Viking, so remember that Viking is a job description and it literally means a raider. <laughs> so not all Norse people were Vikings. Um, Norse people, by the, by the 1400s, they were wearing basically what everyone else in Northern Europe was wearing with more fur because it was getting cold because the little ice age had started to set in. So yeah, so yeah, basically, exactly. See, Tomas is actually uh, from Sweden. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, basically Northern European clothing is what they were wearing with all the layers, but lots of fur linings and, because it was getting cold. <clears throat> I know, I don't, I know, I don't know. But by, by then, by then we had Sweden and we had Denmark and we had Norway. Uh, Finland was part of, ah, in the 1400s. Were they part of Russia or part of Sweden at that point? <laughs> Poor Finland. Um, God, I don't, Vikings, man. It's a job description, people. And I know you all know that. But for anyone who's watching who didn't know that Viking is a job description, not a culture, really. Um, so you have Norse settlements. And yeah, in the 1400s, they were wearing basically Northern European clothing. Also, are you familiar with the Greenland finds? So there was a settlement that died out in Greenland in like the mid 15th century. And they've excavated a lot of graves and found tons and tons and tons and tons of clothing from Greenland. And uh, very well preserved, thanks to the conditions of the soil um, and the type of soil. And um, so it seems that they were wearing very outdated in, in Greenland, they were wearing very outdated fashions. So in Greenland in the 15th century, they were wearing fashions that would have been in fashion in like the early 14th century in a lot of cases um, or mid 14th century. So there's, there's actually lots of extant pieces, but I am loath to use those as documentation for the rest of Scandinavia because Greenland was at the ass end of the world as far as Europe was concerned and as far as the trade routes were concerned. And they didn't have a whole lot of connection at that point with mainland Europe. So they were definitely behind on the times and the colony died out basically <clears throat> because it got too damn cold. Yes. Well, yeah. So yeah, back in the ninth century, there, there's this whole, this leads to the whole idea of the medieval world, even the first millennium world being so interconnected. The Rus, the, yeah, exactly. Um, they, the Rus, the, the Norse traders sort of followed the Volga and, you know, set up all sorts of, of colonies and settlements all going all the way down to Constantinople, basically. So yeah, lots of interconnection. In fact, for those who don't know, they've actually found silver Buddhas in Norse graves in the first millennium, silver Buddha statues. So. They found fifth century glass. In oh yeah, it's very important to me to use the right kind of music in my videos for, for, my, for my era or for the era that I'm discussing. So yeah, there's just a comment that I, they, they love how I use 15th century music in my videos. I'm lucky and that I'm friends with some very, very skilled 15th century musicians who also have recordings of their work and they actually let me use their recordings in my videos. Um, so a lot of the music you hear is from Gaida. They're a station, they're based in Edinburgh, um, gaida.uk.co or .co.uk. Um, and you can actually purchase their music. It's great music for dancing and for listening. Um, and um, then Albrecht, 
Al Kaufman of Istan Pita. He has a lot of recordings and he's going to be launching a 15th century dance music album. We're collaborating on that. And so that's going to be some, that will be in addition to my videos. But yeah, I do believe that music is a really important component of well, life. I guess this brings us back to how Darius said that music really helps with the immersion. Well, music also, in my opinion, enhances the discussion of interesting topics. So I guess maybe next time I should figure out how I can maybe stream some nice gentle music in the background while we have this chat. Music links too, yes. Okay, so let me double check that. I always get the co.uk or uk.co. It's, ah, it was co.uk. Okay, so this is for those interested in the music that you get in my videos. Um, oh, really? John Sales? I'll have to look into that. Um, because my videos don't make enough for me to pay for licensed music. <laughs> um, so that's the that's the link for Gaida, and then Istan. Istan Pita. This is the Istan Pita website, um, and okay, John Sales, thank you, Ocean Answer. <laughs> uh, I will look into that um, because yeah, I'm always always happy to have additional kinds of music available for my for my various videos. <clears throat> uh, sweet, of course, Sweden was part of the Kalmar Union. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, I'm just now getting uh, getting back to the comments. So I asked if Finland was part of Sweden or, or Russia during the 15th century. And uh, Tom, Tomas, my, my resident Swedish courtier, says that it was part of Sweden, but Sweden was part of the Kalmar Union. Yeah, uh, medieval Europe definitely, the map of medieval Europe definitely did not look basically anything like the modern map of medieval Europe, and especially not the 15th century map where Burgundy was the triumphant dominant power and France was just a piddly little whatever. Funny how that changed. We were so close to having Burgundy be the country that fought in World War II <laughs> instead of France, but a strange turn of events that killed Charles the Bold gave us France instead. Fascinating how one person's death can have such far-reaching repercussions. Okay, well, um, any other questions or comments before we uh, we part company? Um, you know, if I kind of, unless you have specific questions about immersive medievalism, I'll just close that off by saying I love doing immersive medievalism. It's my preferred version of medievalism. And if anyone wants me to come and help make their event immersive, then you know, reach out to me and we can see what we can arrange. Because I'm a world traveler. <laughs> you know, you all didn't know I travel quite a lot and I do get hired to go to events worldwide to lead dance and be the contessa. So I'm happy to do that for you, depending on where you are and my schedule. Otherwise, I do appreciate everyone's input today. It's been a great chat and I wish everyone a happy new year. I have guten Rutsch, as they say in German. Have a good slide <laughs> into the new year. <laughs> um well uh I mean, well maybe maybe we can we can arrange something about Sherwood. Reach out maybe um Donna, do you have me on Facebook? I'm on Facebook as both Rachel Lorenz and the Creative Contessa. So I'll just reach out and maybe we can chat about Sherwood. It was great to well chat with you, Darius. I hope to get to see you this year at Penzik, maybe. Um, otherwise, everyone have a lovely day. It was, the honor was all mine, <clears throat> Tommaso, and I'll catch you all on the flip side. Bye, everyone. I'm also, oh, so Donna just said, I'm also, the, I'm the creative Contessa. I'm both. So I'm Rachel Lorenz. I'm the creative Contessa. You can reach me either way. Okay, everyone, I'm really gonna, gonna cut it off now. I'm just gonna see if there's any last minute questions and then we'll cut. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a lag. Oh wait, my husband is trying to signal something. I posted the links to your three cheapo similars and to the Foon Shaw Museum tour. In the comments or in the, in the, in the chat? In, in the chat. chat. Um, okay, so for those of you who are looking for the Foon Shaw Museum tour, the link Portugal. is Portugal. The Foon Shaw, Foon Shaw Portugal Museum, Sacred Art Museum tour. Um, it's very cheeky. It doesn't take itself very seriously at all because there's so many ugly Renaissance babies in that museum that I couldn't resist commenting. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
Um, um, but also uh, somewhere here, somewhere back here. Um, Towards the beginning. I don't think it actually posted, Hanson. Supposedly, my husband posted the links for the Cheapo Similars video and the Funchal tour. I don't think it showed up. Oh, I think it might have blocked it as spam or something. Oh, well, that's annoying. Yeah. Um, we'll post it in the comments. We'll post the comments under the video. We'll post the link for the Funchal Museum tour and for my Cheapo Similars video. I guess I'm not allowed to refer to my own videos in the chat. That's interesting. Okay, everyone. Well, that is it. I appreciate your participation today. It's been really fun chatting with you. And I really hope to see you at like in person sometime at some point. Bye, everyone.